What's up, everyone? Welcome back to the Next Billion podcast. And today we have a very special guest as well I'll introduce in a moment, but really just look around. This is an incredible site. We're in Palau, literally right by the sea. And I'm joined with President Whips. We're going to be talking about crypto blockchain and maybe Palau's sort of place in the world, essentially. So uh, thank you so much for joining us today. It's an honor to have you on, on the podcast. First of all, thank you, George, for this opportunity. It's always good to share about Palau and, and share the beautiful environment that we have. Yeah. Look, yeah. everyone needs to get here as well. I mean, there's literally a reef <laughs> by, the, by the side of the road here. It's amazing. So We're I, surrounded by water. That's it. Hey, it's a tropical island in the Pacific, right? I guess maybe we can start off a little bit about your personal journey to, to get to where you are today. I believe you're a bit of an entrepreneur as well in a previous life, perhaps, but maybe talk us through, like, how did you become President Whips of Palau? Well, first, I think it begins with my parents. My father uh, grew up here, uh, of course, right after the war. Yep. A very difficult life. He lived a life where his father died when he was not even one year old. So he was adopted. Yep. Uh, adopted it at one year old to go to uh, actually his father's cousin's family. And he was there for uh, several years. And then his stepfather and his stepmother both passed away. So my father's story was, you know, one of where he went from family to family to family. He tells the story when he left Palau, everybody at that time would go by boat to Guam to high school. He went to the other side of the boat because there was nobody else there to see him off. But, uh, you know, he left and his goal was to get an education and come home. Uh, he always wanted to come home. He uh, graduated from high school in Guam, couldn't, uh, you know, afford a college education. So he went and signed up for the U.S. military, got into the U.S. military, became a U.S. medic in the Army, and ended up in uh, Baltimore. And that's where he met my mom. Right. Uh, Baltimore, Maryland. So I was born in Baltimore, Maryland, and uh, we would only stay there for three years because my father always wanted to come home. And so he wanted to try to find any way to convince my mother to come to Palau. And he told her, we're just going to go for two years. Well... 50 plus years later, they're still here. They're still here. Yeah. I went to school, came back in uh, 1992 after I got my uh, MBA. And before I went to get my MBA, I had the opportunity as being a special assistant to President Ed Pison. That was for about a year and a half. But it really kind of opened the door for me on the side of government, mm. to understand government. I, we had our family business, so I always knew I was going to be busy mm. with our family business. But... It also helped me to understand that things in government don't move like the private sector. Yes. Uh, very slow, very hard to change. Yeah. What was, I guess, your thoughts there? You, you were presented with the choice perhaps of, wow, okay, we've seen a little bit about how government works, definitely knows how being an entrepreneur works. And then what you sort of made the choice to, to go more into the government side to be like, hey, we need to make it easier for entrepreneurs or, or what was your thinking so behind that? So my, my, my father at that time was still in Congress. So he was actually speaker when I returned from grad school. So I immediately became, they made me CEO of the company. So I was running our family business. Yeah. And uh, it was retail, then kind of expanded to construction. And we do kind of everything. For me, when I came back, it was all about private sector. And I got involved in a lot of NGOs trying to make a difference. But being outside the government, there's only so much you can do. Yes. For my, my motivation to get back into the government, I got into the Senate in 2008. Actually, my father had run for president. He didn't make it in 2008. After the primary elections, when he didn't make it, I ran as a righted candidate in 2008. Right. And I got in, and same thing, you know, I, it's creating opportunities for Palauans to make them live the Palauan dream. That's, that's always been our, our motivation. So it's about getting them decent wages, passing legislation that's innovative, that can create a, a robust and resilient economy that can provide for the people of Palau. You know, that's really, and of course, running an efficient government yeah. that really provides the needs for the people. While uh, I was in as a member of the Senate, we were able to pass laws like the Health Insurance Act for Palau right. that, that, that protects all Palauans. The second term I was in, we were finally able to pass the next minimum wage. My father put it in in 1997. I was able to get it passed in 2013. It's, it's about helping people. Mm. And then I was on the finance committee, so it's about budgeting, using money wisely. Yep. Operations and, uh, kind of operations. stuff, right? Yeah. So, the Senate being one of 29 is different than being one of one on the executive branch, right? Right, right? Of course, you have a team under you, but you can really set the direction. And so I ran in 2016 for yep. president, didn't make it. So then I ran again in 2020, but still the same goal, how to improve the lives of the Palauan people. It's all about changing the world and providing back to your community. So public service is about giving back. Right. And, and how do you go about doing that practically is one question. So Palau, small island nation, mm. small population, Beautiful natural environment, mostly reliant on tourism, I would assume. Fishing, obviously, big industry as well. So where does Palau go to from here? Do you play to your strengths and try and double down on 
things which can boost those industries? Or what's your thinking of where and how Palau can get to that sort of next level to, I guess, sort of reach some of those, yeah. those things that you were talking about, like, you know, living wage and, and all this kind of stuff? So, of course, our strengths are we have a beautiful environment and that helps us in the marine science exploration, the environmental fields, we get a lot of recognition for that. But that also translates into tourism. That also translates into a fisheries industry and aquaculture industry, how to develop that, use it sustainably. And then we've learned from COVID that that's not enough. The other huge advantage that Palau has is it's small, it's an independent country. And being part of the, the world, we were able to maybe adapt and do things that larger countries may take more time to do. This is it, and this is what we've been thinking as well. It's like that small gives you nimbleness, you know, the, the small scale gives you nimbleness to be able to do things that other people can't. Yeah. So it allows us partnerships. Of course, we're, we've been very fortunate to have friends that we support, yep. and they support us, our diplomatic partners. That's an, also very important. We want to do things that uh, we support each other, defending freedom and democracy around the world. I mean, we believe that uh, freedom is so important, and one of the areas that we've seen that has potential is the digital space, yeah. is the financial space. Yeah. But how to create an environment that attracts entrepreneurs, attracts new types of businesses that can really help improve the standard of living of Palauan people. Uh, I was sharing at the State of the Republic address I had yesterday, how there are young Palauans that have gone to the US, gotten educated and have jobs. Now right. they've returned to Palau and are able to do their work remotely from Palau. Yes. That's what we want, that's what we want to see. 100%. So why not live in paradise and do your work? What's holding us back? Right now, I don't see that there's anything that's holding us back to that. Yeah. We've got a fiber optic cable. We have a second one coming. We're gonna have fiber to the home all around Palau. Amazing. That should just open up that space. Uh, you know, one of the things that we do here is radiologists, for example. We don't have a radiologist on island. So we send uh, CT scans off island. We just got a new, brand new MRI machine for our, our hospital, hopefully it'll be operational this summer, yeah. this summer. And they were like, well, you don't have a radiologist. They said, no, we do, we do. Virtually we do. Yeah. <laughs> we, send, we send the scans yep. and they, but why can't a radiologist live in Palau? They can, we just have to do the reverse. We have right. to open up that opportunity. It's coming up with those new ideas. And, and you know, being president, I think it just allows you to meet more people. Yes. And, and connect you with different people around the world, like innovative ideas that have really helped spur some new and innovative ideas that we, we have launched. When I was campaigning, one of the things I talked about was diversifying our economy and the financial industry. Right. But after I got into office, I came, I stumbled across, uh, I was introduced to this idea of having digital residency, which now has opened up a whole new uh, set of opportunities. Which by the way, I am. So you Congratulations. Know, there's myself and, and many other people around the world that have become a Palau digital resident, which is awesome. The, I guess there is a difference between becoming a financial economy, an island economy based on finance. There, there's actually a lot of them around the world, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, a place like the Cayman Islands or something like right. this. Or BBI. BBI, something like this. Bermuda. So yeah. There's a lot, right? Yeah, and they all sort of have the same playbook. And one of the things we were thinking when we were going around here is, does Palau try the playbook from the 1980s of, okay, we try and be like one of these kind of places like the Cayman Islands. Maybe that's one way to drive business and, and maybe it is, but maybe there's, there's other methods which perhaps haven't been tried yet, like the digital identity program and stuff like that, digital nomads, right. people working remote just on a laptop, because that BVI and, and these other places, they don't have that, uh, you know, and they're still focused on, I guess, you know, the, the traditional finance industry and that sort of thing. They're, they're not sort offshore. of- offshore. Offshore, exactly. Yes. It's offshore, right? Company incorporations, that sort yeah. of stuff. And having a company secretary and the company secretary lives on the island and therefore provides a job and everyone needs to pay a thousand bucks a month, uh, a year or something for incorporations. So where do you see the pathway for Palau? Is it maybe striking a balance between those two? Is mm -hmm. it looking at, at digital? If so, why? Like digital, no one's really done it yet, I guess. Like there, there's a few mm -hmm. pioneers in the space, but there's not the track record that you can look back and go, well, these guys did it and it worked out okay for them. So maybe we should do that. What, mm -hmm. What's your take on that? Well, uh, and I think that it's creating and finding that niche, right? Yeah. And being different. I think the traditional model of offshore corporations has got a bad name, right? This, they just do this to evade taxes. We're looking at it differently. We're looking at it at how do we do it the right way and, and really attract businesses that truly are digital businesses. They can be operating anywhere in the world. So why not Palau? That's what we're looking for. We're, we actually have a corporate registry. We're trying to the next step, which is we want all these software digital companies to be registered in Palau. Yes, I would love be, to do that. I would do that tomorrow. Yeah, because <laughs> you can be registered anywhere and operate yeah. out of anywhere. So why not Palau? That, that's really the idea behind the digital residency is first, let's get the digital residency set up 
then go to the next level. Yeah. So there's actually a, a corporate registry act that we have. We're trying to modify it to make it easier right. for people like yourself right. to sign up, get that corporation going in Palau. Yeah. And, and that's something that Estonia has done well with their yes. digital ID <laughs> program. Is they, I guess they, they pioneered it. They have a card. I'm an Estonian digital resident as well. But, but they literally said, look, this is one way for, if you're like a graphic designer or something, and you, you're technically a company, you work for yourself, you're a freelancer, maybe you work on these freelance websites, uh, but they need some sort of stamp on a piece of paper somewhere that says they're you know, a corporation, let's say. And, and often these people, they, they don't really care what, what you know, stamp is on there. It's just what's the easiest, the lowest friction, the way that I can just operate my businesses and get on with things. And, and Estonia went down the path of, of making that super easy and, and linking it to the identity and the card and that sort of thing. Um, I guess that's sort of what Palau is, is looking at yes, uh, as yes. a roadmap, right? That's really the next, the, the next step, trying to make it as seamless. But of course, what we wanted to make sure is that we don't you know, get those actors, bad actors in right. the system. And so that was one of the things that we set up was you, you're, we're selective. Yeah. So there's a, there's a screening process. Yeah. So there's a KYC process that you have to go through to become a digital resident. Anybody can get a passport, right? Yep. Even if you're a criminal, you right. can have a Palau. Uh, but... To be a digital resident, you have to have a clean record. And I think that's important. Yeah. It's important for the banking sector, the financial sector. So we're trying to say, okay, let's let's look at those things that maybe cause the problems and cause try to avoid them. It, it's also duplication because I know that, you know, I have a passport, let's say, but then if I get a whole bunch of bank accounts over here, I get a rental contract over here, I get signed something else, I'm selling a car, I'm showing a passport to everyone and they're duplicating the same process the whole time, right? Mm. Whereas if I can say, hey, no, look, Palau's verified me that I'm a legit guy and I've gone through their process and that process is, you know, top quality, whatever. Cool. Well, maybe I can just reuse that authenticity to be able to do lots of services. And then if I'm running a service here, I don't need to yet again verify people because it's like, hey, they're a digital resident. They've already, you know, done that kind of thing. So mm -hmm. I guess it's about that's the efficiencies you were talking about in sort of bringing more efficiencies to government or, or is there, I guess, other ways that you're thinking about how do you bring some of these digital efficiencies not just from the foreigners coming but maybe also here in Palau like is there you know are people using cards here or is it mainly cash based or you know these sorts of stuff 4G 5G whatever yeah. it might be well thank you for bringing that up because one of the projects that we're trying to launch here is a Palau stablecoin yes there's applications for our digital residents but actually we're trying to launch it locally first one of the biggest problems we have is we use US dollars here uh, and I come from the retail sector. One of our biggest problems is getting coins because the banks, of course, have to bring these coins from the U.S. And who wants to ship pennies to Palau? It costs Not. way more than what the penny's worth. But when we're operating a store and you don't have pennies, the customers are like, we're giving me change. At one point, mm -hmm. we ran out of pennies, so we're giving them candy. And they were, <laughs> they were yelling at us, you know? What am I supposed to do with this candy? <laughs> well, it's $1.20 and, and some candy. A couple of pieces of candy, yeah. <laughs> You know, so how do you solve those types of problems? And one way is to have a make it digital. Of course, people have credit cards, but it's not easy to get a credit card in Palau. Yes, it's not or anywhere e really. Yeah. So, why not have this system? Yep. That eliminates all that. Yeah. So really, a cashless economy, but based on dollar. So that's really our application. So we're going to start with a few people here, test it out to that, and hopefully, we can prove that it works, and then. It, it goes global. And is that something that is, you're looking to get local businesses on board for yes. that? And, and how do you do that, I guess, as well? Or what's the, what's the thinking there? I guess as some context, I literally co-founded the, the first crypto remittance company like eight years ago or something. Okay. And uh, we were doing transfers all around Asia. One of my friends used to uh, do uh, money transfers for a lot of the banks between different Pacific islands. They literally had speedboats going between islands, like ferrying cash, because sometimes you just need cash in one location, right? So. I totally get the, the digitization yeah. uh, sort of initiative, but then it's kind of, how do you get people on board? Like if I'm in Guam or if I'm in, you know, the United States somewhere and I want to send money back to my, my family in Palau and then for them to go and spend that at the local grocery store, not only do you need the grocery store on board, you need the individuals with a wallet on board as well. Mm -hmm. So there's a bit of steps in between the stablecoin existing and getting actual traction for that. I guess, is that still a, a work in motion or do you have any sort of thoughts on when mm -hmm. stablecoin might, might come to be? Or? So of course our partner, I don't, you've heard about Ripple. Yep. Yeah, and so we're gonna use their XRP ledger. Okay. So they're the ones gonna help us create that digital wallet and, and exactly like that. We have islands, so they're literally transporting checks they yep. go over there and they have the cash and go back. We're hoping that that's the future. Yes. To eliminate all of that. Absolutely. And make it easier. And, you know, we're small enough 
that we can demonstrate it yes and test it yeah and then move it to scale yeah that's the, the goal and and having it at scale i think is very beneficial for palau like some of these stable coins that already exist we got usdt usdc they have you know 40 50 60 billion in, in assets and they can invest that and in, say us treasuries at four percent and then if you have 60 billion dollars at four percent you know earning interest and in us treasury is very safe yeah that's a good income stream right, right. so you know, having the Palau stablecoin be something that's adopted ju not just in Palau, but outside Palau as well. I mean, that would be very cool. I guess, you know, that there's maybe some more steps involved in, in no, getting to that stage. No, there's a few more ste steps. Yeah, yes, yeah, yes, yes. yeah. But it certainly starts with, with step, step one, right? Start with step one, try the wallet, see it works, and then go to the next step. Absolutely, absolutely. So how do you see future of, of Palau? Let's say the next 10, 20 years, I guess to, for some context as well, we were talking about previously, you know, a lot of the, the young people might uh, emigrate to, to get an education, you know, like, like your family did as well, mm -hmm. and then come back. Um, but then there's like an interim period where you know, people leaving the island and then you know, getting them to come back and then they need jobs to come back to, right? Right. So what's the next 10 to 20 years look like the ideal solution for what you would want for Palau? How would we get more people here, grow the economy, grow jobs? and bring everyone back. That's why I think we need to embrace the digital space. Right. Web3, yep. I mean, there's so many opportunities there. The reason our young people leave is because of lack of opportunities here. Yeah. I mean, tourism is great, but at the end of the day, it's still a low paying industry. It doesn't provide that financial stability yep. that people are looking for. Yeah. Maybe if you're in college, just got out, for a while it's good, but we need to also develop other more skill robust sets. Yeah, skill yeah. sets. Yeah. We need more lawyers, we need more finance people, we need more accountants, we need more computer scientists, we need, yeah. Yeah. You know, but right now they don't have jobs here. Yeah. How do we create those jobs here? Yeah. And I think that's, uh, how do we create jobs for engineers? The engineers do so much work. Why not all live in Palau and provide services around the world? Absolutely. That, that, that is the future. We know there's a carrying capacity for a number of tourists in Palau before it, it degrades the environment. It doesn't provide that experience. Diversification is a key. And so I, that's really what we want is we want to diversify we want to provide more high paying jobs. We like to say there's Singapore over here. We're a mini Singapore yeah. in the financial sector. There's Hong Kong. Yeah. Uh, Palau is you know, five hours from every major city in Asia. Why can't it be a hub for some corporations if the space is right? Yeah. Like, especially digital corporations. Yeah. Why, not, why, why not Palau as the hub for and, Asia? And what would, I guess, be your message to those out there? I guess our audience is a lot of crypto people, blockchain people in various roles, a lot of engineers and, and that sort of thing. If they want to get involved or they want to, can they just start businesses in Palau? What would be your message for, I guess, the audience out there of how do they get involved in this, this I guess, revolution of, of what's happening here in Palau? First of all, we need advice on what model you think is the best to do that because we're, we're in the midst of trying to finish that legislation to get yeah. it through. Congress. We've looked at different models. Is it the Delaware model? Is it the Cayman model? Is it uh, Cook Islands? Is it Wyoming? And we're still, what's the model yep. that will create the environment that we can bring these up entrepreneurs and really make a difference? That's something that we're, we're right at the cusp of deciding and, and getting through. I talked about it yesterday, the address about the opportunities in the digital space. And I think seeing the progress that we've made in digital residence. Yep. So I think our Congress is very much aware of what the potential is. Yep. Now, what are the other things we can put in place yeah. to make this a success? I, uh, I think there's maybe four and a half thousand last time I checked that did the... It's, uh, it's over 5,000 now. Now the, over 5,000, okay. So it's, 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 it's growing. Amazing. And, yeah. and it's like, what do we, what's so the next, the next so sell after that? Now we're going to try to add phone numbers, uh, an address, and next is we got to add a corporation. Awesome. So that's uh, the step. Hopefully it'll be a new revolution. I mean, we can rewrite the playbook, set something different. Well, th that's what it's all about, I think, is Palau has you know, a small and, and nimble place that can just go and make these, these new rules and, and different ways of doing things that perhaps other people haven't thought of before. And, and it needs people that are out there. If you're interested, definitely come on down to Palau. Come on over, come and see this beautiful place. Get involved in, in some capacity. Certainly the Digital Residence Program uh, implore everyone to, to get involved in that. And as a digital nomad myself, the, the phone number thing, that's that super important. All of these apps, they need you to verify mm. a phone number. I literally buy phone numbers on an app for the United Kingdom to, to verify these things because I don't have a SIM card because what's the point? I go to one country, I buy a SIM card, then it doesn't work when I get on a plane in a month's time. Yeah. So I just need a, a SIM card that has data that I can you know get messages from that works the whole year. So it's, it's stuff like that, right? Yeah, yeah. And I think those kind of things really appeal to at least myself and, mm. and other people out there. So really excited to, to what's happening here in Palau. Yeah, if anyone has any questions, definitely uh, check out the, the Palau Digital Residence Program. Stay 
tuned to our socials and, and everything like that, we'll be posting about it. But there's, is there anywhere that you would implore people to go to, maybe websites or, or anything like that, or just tune in to, to what the news is is in Palau? And yeah, keep, well, keep you can go to the Facebook uh, page for Office of the President. Okay. You can type a comment in there. Check it out. But I think you can message there. Yep. And, and just give a suggestion. Yep. The other way is uh, the Palau government website. Yeah, yeah, there's a Palau government website. There's a way to contact us through that. Absolutely. We want ideas. Yeah. Uh, that's how you make good policy. Yeah. Is being open, trying to listen. I need to hear from the digital nomads. Yeah. What, what is the best that would make it attractive to you? Absolutely. Palau attractive to you. Amazing. So, Amazing. So I'd like to see those uh, comments and ideas. What's up everyone? We're, we're back again with President Whips and we're in a different locale. We're not next to a, a reef and corals and interesting fish and, and all this kind of stuff. We're actually at the Capitol building. So uh, maybe if you could, um, you know, President Whips, maybe tell us a little bit about, about this building. Like how did it come to be? It's quite peculiarly located. We've got greenery all around us, right? And uh, we've, we've just came from Karor, the main city, mm -hmm. which is quite a drive away. Um, but, uh, but yeah, this is a fantastic, you know, capital building. So, I mean, how old is this? And when did, when did this uh, get set up? So um, in our constitution, uh, there was a requirement after 1980, when we became our gov government that within 15 years, we'd relocate the capital. Well, relocating the capital needs money. Yep. So that didn't happen. This building was, wasn't completed until 2007. So from 1980 to 2007, took a little while, 27 years. So we've been here since uh, for the past 15 years. And this location was picked because you have, we have the big island that bubbled out. This is 26 miles from Koror. And the idea was uh, if you build far enough away, you, you bring development north to get out of the crowded city. Once again, it takes infrastructure. It takes, uh, hopefully over time, people continue to move further north. Uh, we've seen that, but it just it just takes time. So that's why it's all green around here because people have uh, uh, stayed around the most of the infrastructure and what's happening in the business activity downtown. Absolutely. And and when we were walking in as well, we saw a lot of the different flags and sort of the, the different diplomatic relations Palau has with mm -hmm. the rest of the world. Maybe it'd be good for, for people out there that aren't familiar with Palau's position in the world. Like what's the you know, the diplomatic position of Palau right now, or, you know, we're also talking about just connections to the world, right? Like yeah. flight, that was a big thing that, that we spoke about. So how do we get here? Like, I know there's, there's it's a small island, there's, there's not that many connections, it's not a mm. Hong Kong, but, you know, there, there's only a few, but they're growing, right? Yeah. So first of all, our, of course, our, we became totally independent in 1994. We were under a, we were a trust territory of the United States after World War II. So for 50 years, we were under the administration of the United States. And since that time, Palau has, of course, become a, became a member of the UN in 1994. And we have what we call diplomatic relations with over 100 countries. But, uh, you know, the first countries, of course, was the United States, Japan, and then uh, Australia was one of the first ones that we signed up with because they're our closest partners. Yeah. We have four embassies that are located in Palau. Uh, so we have, uh, the United States has an embassy here. We have an ambassador here. We have the Japanese embassy here. There's an ambassador here for the Japanese embassy. We have the Australian embassy, which is the newest. And then we have the Taiwanese embassy that's been here since 99. Uh, they're very strong partners. They all contribute to really the, the growth of our country. And we're most appreciative of Australia starting a very new flight, helping us with a flight that starts from Brisbane uh, with a stopover in Port Moresby and then on to Palau. And uh, this was an important step because, you know, we there's kind of a disconnect between the North and South Pacific. These small islands, there's not much connectivity. So this really provides an opportunity. Of course, business travel, government travel, more interaction people to people. But more importantly, uh, for our economy is to hopefully bring uh, Australian tourists to come and visit Palau. You've been to Fiji, you've been to Bali, come and explore Palau. And also when, when we came, we came from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Mm. So we had to go up to Taiwan and then back down to Palau as well. So it was a bit of an indirect route to right, get there, right. right? So I think the more routes that, that, uh, that happen, the, the better. And, and I, was it there was also a Singapore route as well happening or yeah, potentially so, happening? Yeah, so we're, 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 we're just trying to reopen uh, routes. We used to have a route from, we have one to Manila yep. currently, uh, one to Taiwan and one 
to Guam and the other one to Brisbane. Those yep. are the four routes we have. But we used to have flights direct from Japan, Korea, Hong Kong, and Macau. We're, I think we're almost uh, ready to have Macau open up again and maybe Hong Kong. We're working with Singapore to try to get them going. And hopefully this summer we'll also have uh, Korea uh, open again. Hey, connectivity is very important. Really what we like to have is our own Palau airline. And then from here we go everywhere and, and bring people here. Right. Like Fiji, you know? Yeah. yeah. And I'm sure you look at this capital and go, why this building compared to the typical A-frame Abai, yeah. that's our traditional men's meeting house. So the chief of uh, Malkayok, his name is Raklai, and there's 16 main chiefs of Palau, but then each village has a, at least a 10 chiefs or maybe even more. And these so, are the different states of Palau as well. That yeah, that's a, because we used to fight with each other. Right. And, and so the symbols that you see painted on the, the building, that's from the Abais. Right. But the building, of course, looks like um, Washington, D.C. It does, yeah. Uh, and this is, of Inspired. course, this is our co co congressional building that we see be behind us. There's three buildings here. There's, in the, there's the Congress, there's the, the judiciary, and then there's the executive branch. So three branches of government. Yeah. But uh, so I asked the chief, so why not build it in a traditional Abai yeah. shape? And he said, we don't want to take away from our culture. Our culture has the chiefs. We have our own system of government that we had. But this, we're in a new type of government. Mm. Uh, and, and this type of ar architecture symbolizes democracy. Right. So that's, that was the thought. So they, they, that's why they chose this. And I said, okay, I respect that. Yeah. But we were talking about travelers as well, right? Mm. And preserving the environment. And this is a big, it's a big thing for Palau. Because essentially, this country, it's all about the environment. You know, that, yeah. that's what... That's what is the revenue source, right, for the, yes. for the government mostly, uh, I would assume. We right? like to say uh, our environment is our economy. Yeah. Or our economy is our environment, either yeah. way you look at it. And, and so it's so important for us to really balance protection mm. and production. So when we overfish and we overuse uh, something, it's not sustainable, we don't have it anymore. Yeah. So we have a uh, really um, tradition in Palau that the chiefs passed down from, for generations because, you know, there was a lot of people living on the islands and resources would become scarce. And what they would do as a management practice is the chiefs would get together and say, OK, we're going to have a bull. It's called B-U-L. We're going to close off this area for a while and let it rejuvenate and mm. let it get back. So Palau has some sites that have been closed since the 1950s that nobody can go inside in the rock islands it's called the 70 islands a famous site but you know uh, over time we felt that that wasn't enough as population grows more demands for tourism we need to do a better job in managing these resources so there began a program in the early 2000s it's called the protected areas network and so there was a series of each state came up with designated areas that there's no fishing, the areas protected because it's an important spawning ground. Uh, there's an important habitat there that uh, we want to protect so that it's, it's, it's not destroyed. And so that, that, that began. We also have uh, laws that go in and protect certain species of fish that you don't take, like the bumphead parrotfish and the Napoleon wrasse. We also banned exports of any reef fish outside of Palau. Yep. That used to be a big export for fishermen here locally. And, and so we say, if you want to enjoy the fresh local fish, you come to Palau. And then, you know, uh, one of the things that Palau passed in 2015 was the Palau National Marine Sanctuary Act, mm. which uh, basically our entire EEZ is 100% managed. And then they said, OK, you know, we're really being overexploited by the foreign fishing fleets. We need to rethink this. We're just going to close off 80% to no fishing for now. Let's see how we can help it revive, but do our contribution to the world uh, in protecting our oceans. So, you know, we ban deep sea mining, we ban deep sea trawling, we protect the sharks, we protect the turtles and the rays and, and the dugongs and the whales and, you know, all those Fantastic. important things. We believe that we've been blessed with what we have and we have a responsibility to be good stewards. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, that's why it's so important for us to diversify our economy because diversifying our economy puts less stress on these important resources or treasures that we have. And I've noticed that, you know, Palau's remarkably clean as well. Yeah. Uh, and, and totally makes sense, you know, that, that's the main selling point. And, and I guess as well, essentially what, what you're doing every day, right? Uh, is this the office and, and, you know, you're talking to these, you know, these other countries and, and what's the, the life of a president in Palau? Well, yeah. Maybe a bit of context about what, what's, what's required on an average day. Well, this morning before I met with you, I, I had a meeting with the ambassador from Australia yeah. and a delegation here talking about national security issues. And then, uh, of course, I have an interview with you promoting Palau. And, That's it. And seeing what we're doing about, uh, you know, interesting programs that we have from digital residency to inviting digital nomads. Yep. And then after, after this, I have to go to a, a village, a sta one of the states that had a community project that they were rebuilding a seawall that was damaged basically to climate change mm. and trying to protect the, the shoreline and from erosion and coastal erosion. So 
Uh, I'm going there with the ambassador from Taiwan. Okay. Because it's a grant that uh, it's a it's a we call it a, like a grassroots grant. Yeah. To help the communities and young people get together and do these activities, which is a, a great thing. And then so that's kind of a typical day. And then uh, meet with some congressmen, talk about issues, about important laws that we need to pass. Go meet with the chiefs, meet with the governors. And then on the world stage, whether it's the UN or uh, at those COP meetings, yeah. to talk about the issues, that, the challenges that we have with climate change and, and getting the world you know, to commit to making a difference. Yeah. Because Palau doing all their, their efforts, in the concert. Well, I was doing a lot yeah. in that front. It's not enough. Yep. Uh, but we're hoping that we can demonstrate that we're doing our part and encourage others to follow. And this is what it's all about. And this is what we spoke about yesterday mm -hmm. with the, 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 the digital programs that, that's going yeah. on as well, like the residency is Palau has the ability as a small nation to be able to innovate and, and be that first mover that maybe is you know, a sign for other countries to look at, oh, well, look, they did it. So maybe we can do it as well. Exactly. Right. And it's like someone's got to do it uh, to, to get started. Right. So yeah. that's that's really good to see. And, and, and so that, that really is our, our uh, protected areas network was yeah. the goal was the near shore resources to be 30 percent to be protected. Yeah. By 2030. Yeah. Or no, it was 2020 was the goal. Yeah. And we we, we exceeded that. The world is still trying to get the 30 percent. The same thing that we've promoted. We're on a high level panel with uh, Norway and then uh, the other large countries of the world. And finally, a hundred, more than 100 countries have signed on to agree that by 2030, 100% of the oceans will be managed with 30% protected. That's, that's the goal. Fantastic. So, so by le leading and showing what we're doing here, hopefully the world can follow because that's what it takes. It takes all of us working together. Absolutely. It, it's a talking point as well. And, and it seems like, you know, from everything that you're doing, you're a bit of a marketing guy, you're a bit of a business development guy. <laughs> You're a bit of a, you know, the community aspect is very important as well. A lot of different things. You've got to wear a lot of hats to That's be right. able to do this. And try to be an expert in everything, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Soon yeah. you'll be a crypto guy as no, well. So, yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm learning. Yeah. yeah, very good, very good. Well, thank you so much for your time. I, need, I know you need to, to jump very soon, but uh, look, we're, we're really excited to, uh, to be here and, and everyone to, to get out there, take a look at Palau. We're going to be putting some of the links below to some of the things that we've discussed and uh, Yes, yeah, certainly the digital residence program is amazing. And, and for digital nomads as well, this is a really cool up and coming destination. And yeah, we want to help do our part to, to let the world know about this, this leading role that Palau is trying to do. So yeah. thank you so much for your time. Well, thank it's you. Been a pleasure coming on the podcast today. Okay. Thank you.